like to introduce to you Jeremy Feynman. He is our guest speaker today. Many of you know Jeremy as your lab instructor, right? Yeah. 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 Cool. Jeremy. Jeremy is a uh, second year graduate student, mm -hmm. slated to graduate in May, yep. barring a successful defense of his thesis, which he will defend in May of 2013. Uh, to a public board, possibly, right? So many of you possibly. It's on the current topic, the Olympics. What? It's on the current topic, National Identity in the Olympics. Great. So they could cheer, cheer, or sneer uh, in the in the audience. Cheer. 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 And this correlates with chapter four material out of our textbook. And Jeremy takes us beyond our textbook uh, with some interesting uh, research and factoids. And it doesn't surprise me that you do this. And, uh, and you do so in an interesting way. And so he'll be talking about perception. And then the quiz that you'll take will be on material that, that Jeremy presents. So if you're just walking into class, Jeremy Feynman is our guest speaker. This is how we develop perception. Perception starts with selection, organization, and interpretation. It influences how we act, how we react, and communicate with others in our daily life. Everything that we do depends upon how we perceive it. So does it doesn't really matter? Or is this just a uh, space filler at the textbook so that the authors had a reason to sell you a large, expensive textbook? Who here, show of hands, who here thinks that perception matters? All right. Anyone want to volunteer why perception matters? Perception matters because it influences how we feel about a situation and, can, and how we communicate about a situation. It can lead to wrongful assumptions and even discrimination. Now, three questions. Uh, attractive people have an easier time finding employment. Attractive people have a more difficult time finding employment. Or, Attractive people, it makes no difference whatsoever. Who here believes that attractive people have an easier time finding employment? 
All right. Who here believes that attractive people have a more difficult time finding employment? And who here believes that it makes no difference whatsoever? Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I set you up for a little bit of a trick question. Last year, two Israeli scholars conducted a study. And they, what they examined was how people perceive attractive people. <coughs> Austin Wilde here sets this up pretty good for it. He says the optimist sees the donut, while the pessimist sees the whole. In other words, what Oscar Wilde is talking about is how we perceive a situation is if we think it's going to be in our favor or not. Many of you probably watched the Packers in Seahawks game last night, right? Now, if you're a Packers fan, how did you perceive this final call? Interception. How did you perceive the uh, qualifications of the refs? Club qualification. Now, if you're a Seahawks fan, you might be like, you know what? I agree with that call. So how we perceive things depends on how we feel about this. If we feel, feel it's in our favor, we're going to feel good about a situation. If we feel that um, something is not in our favor, we're going to not like the situation whatsoever. The study I was referring to, I apologize, I jumped a little bit ahead, took 2,500 job opens in Israel. Now, what you need to understand from this study is the outside of the United States and Canada is common practice to send photographs with a resume. So what they did was they found 2,500 job openings. They split it right down the middle. In one group, you had 1,250 job openings. In the second group, you had 1,250 job openings. Each group was composed of either all men, men or all women. For each job opening, they sent a resume without a photograph. They then sent an identical resume in terms of qualifications and experience. All they did was change the names, but they also sent a photograph. They either sent a photograph of an attractive male, a plain looking male, an attractive female, or a plain looking female. <laughs> now why do you think the attractive men at the highest rate of return for being invited to their interview, and the attractive women got the lowest rate of return. If, we, if we're saying here that it's easier for attractive people to find a job, why do the attractive women have a more difficult time than the attractive men? Okay, so we have a perception that if you're an attractive woman, you're not intelligent that you can't be both uh, attractive woman and intelligent at the same time. It's a stereotype that we form, unfortunately, in our society. For other reasons, think about, let me put it this way, think about who often works in human resources departments. Can you say that a little longer? Women, yeah. The study found that 90% of those who made the determination of who got an interview and who did it were women. Their average age was 29. They were between the ages of 23 and 44. The researchers of this study dug a little bit deeper, and while they still have to um, do tests on the exact cause, they hypothesized that jealousy or fear that uh, attractive women will compete, cause competition with the men in the, in the office. They hypothesized that um, the human resources workers were fearful of the competition. They perceived that these attractive women would become competition for them. They looked at the photographs of the women. They, they, um, they saw with their eyes. They, reckon, they organized or categorized them as attractive women. And they interpreted that attractiveness as competition, something that they could not tolerate inside the office place. This whole process started with sensory input. Sens sensory input is where perception starts. It's a collection of information from our environment. We collect information or input like a computer into our minds through sensory organs that include the eyes, the ears, the olfactory organs, the tongue, the skin. Information we collect provides the raw data to construct our worldview. We perceive what is limited by biology and psychology. If we can perceive everything, we'd be overwhelmed. We got all that. Were you overwhelmed? So was I. 
What I was trying to set you up, though, is to give you an idea of what would happen if you perceive everything in the world and the universe around you. We, we go nuts. It'd be, it'd be so much to take in, we couldn't organize it. So we have different filters that we use that are either part of our biological design or part of our psychological <coughs> makeup. First, our biological design. Humans, we're kind of limited as humans. We're, we're not Superman. We, we can't do great feats. We, we can't see through walls or anything like that. Even what we can see is a very small portion of the universe. Who here has heard of the electromagnetic spectrum from high school science class? Okay, you remember how visible light is only one small part of that entire band? Visible light only closes one millionth of 1% 1 of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's energy bouncing around this room like crazy. We've got, it's a little warm in here. We've got infrared energy bouncing around this room. We can't see that unless we put special goggles on. We've got x-rays, we've got gamma rays, we've got radio waves, we've got TV signal rays. Hearing, we're limited in hearing too. Humans can only hear between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. This is an artist's depiction of a black hole right here. A black hole creates the lowest known sound to science. It is one million billion, one million billion times below the human threshold. For you music majors, that's 57 octaves below middle C. But even this small slice of the universe is too much for us to take in. We have to narrow it down. We have to practice selection, attention. Where we narrow down the information and we separate from what's most pertinent to us to what we can ignore. We do this through five mechanisms. Intensity, size, contrast, con contrast, repetition, and movement. Give you a moment to write those five down. is a sudden increase of sensory stimulation, stimulation, bright light, sudden sound. When you hear this, what do you, what, what catches your attention? What, what do you know when you hear this suddenly? You want me to play it again? Center. You got the TV on in the background. You try to do homework, and all of a sudden you hear this. You know that a big story in the sports world is about to come on, and you hear this suddenly. So what do you, what, what might you think? That the sto sports story that you've been waiting about, the, the trade that you've been waiting for, uh, the refs finally coming back to the NFL, it might happen. It catches your attention because of that sudden noise. It's an evolutionary leftover from our early ancestors. We hear it, we're in the woods, we hear a sudden noise, we know to either investigate, to fight, or fight, to get the heck out of there. The other one, size. The horse here, I mean our canine friend, illustrates for us what size does. It sticks out, it grabs our attention. Contrast, when something doesn't fit in. Who here remembers on Sesame Street, which one of these things isn't like the other? That was, con that was a contrast exercise, when something didn't fit in place. We've got Al here trying to hide with a bunch of cats that it looks similar to. Doesn't quite work. Repetition. Anyone who's been with a young child knows this one. Mom, 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 I really want mom, mom. The, the constant repetition of the mom, wine, hand, or sound grabs our attention. Those of you who have had experience with young children, think about late at night. You've got, you've got a um, leaky faucet. Drip, drip, drip. You can hear it down the hall. Does it make it more difficult to get to sleep? Because you have that constant sensory input 
that's going on, that won't let you fall asleep. Movement is another leftover, leftover product for evolution. Imagine we're all two, three hundred million years ago with our ancestors. We're walking in the tall grass of the African savanna. Suddenly, in the middle distance, some of us see the grass move. It's standing to contrast with the still grass, we're like, it's not windy. Why is that grass moving? So some of us choose, you know what? I don't like where this is going. I'm getting out here. Half of, us, half of us choose, you know what, look at those fools run, what the heck are they doing? Well, the half that choose not to run become dinner, and the rest of us get to live another day. We, we caught movement going on in our environment. We realized something wasn't right, something about our environment had changed. After we collect information, we have to start to organize, to make it more simple for us to digest. We do this through cognitive recognition. We do this through cognitive recognition and also um, through categorization. I'm sorry, cognitive representation. My bad. Cognitive representation. Cognitive representation is the human ability to form, form models or patterns of the world we live in. Humans love patterns. We learn by patterns. We use, we use patterns in the basic model. And we use, patterns are essential to the basic model of learning, advocated here by William Ball. William Ball was a theater director who used, used this to teach students in the late 1970s and early 1980s. He said that we first discover a pattern, <coughs> then we test a pattern, and then we put a pattern into place. Now, how many of you as children had one of these. A little toddler, you had a little block set. Okay, you're two years old again. You've got this block set. You've got in your hand a square block. Unfortunately, you're trying to put it into the round hole. You're not having much success. You're wondering, why isn't this working? You, you move it to the triangle hole. You're still trying to get it to go in. You're about ready to throw the a tantrum. And you're starting to get upset. You, you, in your frustration, you shove the block aside, and it happens to fall in the square hole. And you're like, okay, um, I got that done, now let's move on to the next step. You, you grab a hexagon block. You, you start trying to put it into the triangle hole. It's not working. All of a sudden, you notice the triangle hole, the hexagon hole. You, the gears start turning in your head. You take the hexagon block, and you put it in the hexagon hole. You've just discovered the pattern. Now you, you, you think you're onto something here. You've got to test it though. So you take the triangle block, you put, and you find the triangle hole. You put it into, and you put it in. And you're like, okay, I tested it. It worked. Now you start taking all the other blocks, the round block, putting it in the round hole, and so on. The star block put it in the star hole, and you've discovered the pattern. You discovered the pattern. You've tested it, and you put it into place. We, use, we like patterns because they catch in our mind. The Greeks used patterns in the form of rhyme to memorize long speeches. We even teach the alphabet to our children with patterns. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We use song. William Shakespeare used a form of beat called iambic contaminer. Who here has heard of iambic contaminer? Awesome, I'm glad to see the English departments are teaching that. As a theater student, I'm glad to see that's being taught in high school. I am a contaminator is an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. We have five pairs of these per line in a Shakespearean place. He used it because it gave the actors a beat to remember to latch on the words to. When we get a song stuck in our head, it's because of the pattern, it's because of the beat. Who here has gone through an entire day and you're like, I've got this song stuck in my head? It may be the most annoying song, it may be a song you love. Okay, it's because of the beat. It's because of the beat of the pattern. I want to play a song for you right now. And as you, once you catch on to the beat, once you catch on to the pattern, I want you to clap to it. <laughs>
Jeez. <laughs> yeah, Freddie Mercury. Probably one of the best musicians of all time, at least in my opinion. If you haven't listened to Queen's other songs, I highly suggest that you do. Okay, so we have these patterns. We use them because they, they stick in our mind. We're encouraging you to use a pattern in your speech. This week, as you work on your thesis and your mini thesis, we're encouraging you to build a pattern. I've got an example for you. Sean O'Casey is one of my favorite playwrights. I did my master's thesis on, in theater on him. He's an Irish playwright. So I have here, Sean O'Casey was Ireland's champion because O'Casey was of humble means, O'Casey was stubborn, and O'Casey was witty. What's the pattern? Sean O'Casey was. They start with O'Casey, parallelism. O'Casey was. You know what's coming up next. Every time in my speech that I come to say O'Casey was, you know I'm about to transition into a new point. So once we, once we have a pattern, we have to put it to work. We develop apps. We have cognitive maps or apps that we use to get us through daily life. We have three basic apps. Just like a smartphone, we start with a basic program and we add on to it. Our first app is schemas. These are influenced by social norms and customs. They're also dependent upon prototypes. Prototypes are categories that we see it creating, which I'll get into in a moment. Some prototypes are man, woman, child, elderly person, nerd, jock. Now, would I, would I most likely approach someone I perceive as a nerd and talk to them about the game last night? No, because I, as I, I categorize that individual. I, I think I've come to believe that they're not interested in football. Now, if I see someone wearing a football jersey, or I see someone that I recognize as a football player, would I be more likely to come up to them and go, what'd you think of that final call last night? Would I be more likely to talk to them about that than the nerd? Yeah, because I've categorized them. I, I've recognized that's a jock. He's interested in sports, or she's interested in sports. See, I just made a category. I just made an assumption there. I assume that all jocks are men, when jocks can be female too. Two, we have athletes or women. We use these schemas. We use these schemas to get us through basic day-to-day -day conversations. It, it shapes our language and the language that we use and choose not to use. As we gain experience, we start to update our program. We start to update our personal apps. And we start to move up to the plan. Planning is the version 2.0 of our cognitive maps. This is the student version. We start getting some options going on here. Planning is a, planning is a cognitive map that has an intentional goal. Planning depend, is, differs depending upon who you're communicating with. For example, you need a favor, you need help. Are you going to approach Amy, myself, or any of your GAs in the same manner that you would approach your friend? How many of you would come up to Amy or myself or one of your GAs and go, I really need you to do this for me. Besides, you owe me for that one time. Anyone here brave enough to try that? <laughs> okay, now would you do that with your friend if you needed a favor? I really need you to do this for me besides you owe me a favor. <coughs> it really came down to it. Yeah, you, 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 you eventually would be willing to play that plan. Yeah. <coughs> plans don't always work though. We sometimes have to modify our plans. This is where we're different from a smartphone. We can modify a program mid course. So, you try that on me. You're like, you know what, Jeremy? You owe me for that one time that, you, that I did a favor for you. You realize I'm not responding to this well. That I'm giving you a bit of a look going. So, you're, you realize, oh shoot, I shouldn't have said that. You start to backpedal. You start to realize I missed something in, something in the past. So your sensory selection starts to kick in and you're like, okay, what did I miss? Where, where's the pattern that I missed? 
you find the new pattern, you start to engage in me, you change the way that you engage with me. You may often when you engage with someone who holds a higher social rank in the workplace or in society or in, in the academic setting, you, you mimic how they communicate. As you notice right now, I'm communicating with my hands quite a bit. So you may start talking with your hands a little bit. It's partly unconscious, but it's also, um, it's also conscious. You're trying to gain my favor. Once we put a plan into place, and we've used it multiple times, and we've tested it, we move up to interpersonal scripts. Interpersonal scripts are our next upgrade, version 3.0. They are the full business version. Interpersonal scripts are also shaped by social norms and customs. And they're dependent upon the situation. For example, in the United States, we do have some level of respect for the elder and how we communicate with them. But it's nowhere near the level of respect that they have in other nations such as India. In India, they will they will talk towards an elder, even someone who's just a few years older than them, or has more experience, with a higher level of respect. It's their social norm and custom that's gone into their programming for their schema, then to their planning, and then to their interpersonal scripts. The experience we have with an individual also influences our interpersonal scripts. If I, if I went up to one of my friends and I said, how are you doing, swamp rat? They, 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 it might be an inside joke. They might be okay with it. If I go up to one of you and go, hey, swamp rat, how are you doing? How are you going to feel about that? Confused. There's going to be uncertainty. There's going to be um, discomfort. I've committed a uh, expectation violation. I feel I've miscategorized you as a friend and rather than an acquaintance or someone that I don't know. And speaking of categorize, our next type of cognitive recognition. For these maps to work, for cognitive maps, for apps to work, we have to figure out what category people fall into. We do this with everything, not just people, but objects, situations. We do it because it makes our lives easier. If I ask each and every one of you to take out a piece of paper and a pencil and draw me a cup, we have, what is there, about 88 in here today? Right at 100. Right at 100, okay. We have about 100 different examples of cups. But if we were to go through each and every one of them in the ne next hour and go and just start taking a vote, we'd all pretty much agree that they all fit the criteria of a cup. If we ask for a criteria of a restaurant, there'd be many things that we disagree upon, but many criteria we would agree upon. We create our own categories, but they are largely influenced by what society deems fits into these categories, or what the, the criteria for these categories are. We do it with people, too. Unfortunately, when we do it with people, we run the risk of stereotypes. And we have all stereotypes right here. College students. Some people think all college students do is socialize, but we're not doing anything. We're just all right, we're at a four-year day camp. Many, many think that college students are studious. Perhaps your mother thinks that you're studying constantly, day in, day out. Many in society think that we party at night and sleep during the day. Many think that we're doing nothing but eating up cash. It's, it's a favorite tool of politicians. It's like colleges are too expensive for us to invest in. We even apply stereotypes to ourselves. How many people imagine themselves in this situation sometimes? <laughs> oh, wait. My name is Mary Okay. We, also rec we can also um, apply more than one stereotype to us. We may see ourselves as being very studious and driving ourselves, driving too much stress, but we also realize, you know what? I goof around on Facebook now and then, too. <clears throat> These categorizations and the scripts that we enact help us form frames to how we view the world. They're also dependent upon these frames. 
frames. It, it's a process that they're pulling at each other. It's, think of it as a circle. The, categ the categories and the uh, interpersonal scripts that we develop feed into the frames, and the frames help feed into the categories and our personal scripts. Our frames are shaped both individually and socially. <laughs> There are many a more and stuff like that, and unfortunately, I'm not a coffee drinker. Individually, our frames can be shaped by physical differences. Every, many of you in here are a little bit younger than me. You probably have slightly better hearing. Who, if you read the text for today, you came across the article that talked about cell phone ringers that are at a higher tone that adults over 25 typically can't hear. This is being used for sneaking out, sneaking around text messages in high school. Experience. Cognitive complexity is used in the book. It's really a fancy way of saying life experience. The more life experience we have, the more points of reference we can draw upon to form our frames for our view of the world. Think of a frame as a picture frame and you're looking through the world through it. You recognize what's in the picture frame as being acceptable, what's outside the picture frame as being unacceptable. Personality. If we're optimistic or pessimistic, if we're in a bad mood that day. So this owl or an actual individual that walked in here looking disheveled like this, holding an empty coffee cup all annoyed, would you really want to approach him? <laughs> Remember what Oscar Wilde said about um, optimism and pessimism. The optimist sees the donut, the pessimist sees the whole. Society influences how we do, how we form frames. Our role of power and position in society views the frame that we show. Well, if we hold a high amount of power, a high amount, uh, a high position, those who don't have anything, we may view them through the frame of they're not working hard enough. Culture. Some cultures place different culture, different cultures place different stresses on which sensory perceptions are the most important. The United States places a value upon visual stimulation. We prefer to express things and um, experience things through sight. Other cultures, such as those in the Andes Mountains, use hearing. Even what's considered a good stimulation and a bad stimulation differs per culture. The United States Department of Defense has conducted research into different smells. And they eventually rejected this project, but what they were considering doing for non-lethal crowd control is injecting grenades into crowds that would emit different smells, depending upon the region of the world they were in. Some of the smells that they were experimenting with were raw fish, sewage, but they were all would, would anyone here really want to smell either one of those? Raw fish or sewage? I, I would venture not. But they were also experimenting with smells that may be pleasant to us, but be um, suspicious in other cultures. Cinnamon, lemon, vanilla. Now think about that for a second. You have never in your life smelled cinnamon before. You're at a protest. The protest is starting to get rowdy, so they start throwing these grenades into the crowd. All of a sudden, you start smelling the smell that you've never smelled before. It, we know it as cinnamon, but you don't know it as cinnamon. Are you going to re how, how do you think you may react to that smell? Did you say something? Okay. Uh, you, you might want, okay, that don't smell right, and you might start to leave. You might hear it poison or some sort of gas, especially if you start seeing smoke clouds rise up. We, we attribute, with that smell, we attribute something to it. We, attribute, we use attribution to judge a situation too. Attribution theory explains the process we use to judge our own behavior and the behavior of others. And views, as we plug in holes to make sense of the situation, even if we don't have all the facts of the situation, we want to feel a sense that we know what's going on. So we take, we, we, we often make up facts in our minds, that we think are reasonable, and we attribute it to the situation. When we judge ourselves in a positive expectation violation, in other words, we surpass the standards that were expected of us, we like to claim an internal or personal reason. You know what, I got that work done early because I am a hard worker. When we judge others in a positive situation, 
or a positive expectation violation, we like to use external reasons or situational reasons, such as Tim got the work done early, but that's only because Tim had help. When we're in a negative expectation violation, such as not getting the work done, I, when I'm talking about myself, I may say I couldn't get the work done. I was sick. When it's negative, we like to use about others, we like to use internal reasons. So, excuse me, Tim didn't get the work done because Tim was just lazy. When we do this, we risk fundamental attribution error. And this occurs when we judge others by our personal and cultural standards and give less credit and more blame. One good sign that we're doing this is that we're, tr we're trying to mind read what's on their mind. We're trying to read what's on their minds. I'm not a mind reader. I'm certainly hoping right now that none of you are capable of reading my mind. We just can't do it. So we're making assumptions that may or may not be there. This is, this is a difficult thing for us to avoid, but we can avoid it if we are mindful of a few things. We need to practice mindfulness. We need to be mindful that there are multiple points of view out there. We all have a different perception. Mindful that it's okay to change our minds. Once we make up, once we determine, once we have made a decision, we're not committed to it. Humans are very, are what Dr. Stendler calls cognitive mind misers. Once we've made up our mind, we don't want to put more minute energy into thinking about it than we have to. We need to be mindful um, <coughs> that we are not mind readers. We also need to be mindful that we we should approach each situation as if it were new. We have these apps that we can depend upon to guide us through a situation, but we should approach each individual that we're engaging with as if we've never approached that type of situation before. Why do I say that? Why do you think, what happens when we approach a situation as something new rather than old practice? What, what happens to our attention level detail? It goes up. Our attention to detail goes up when we're in a new situation. We're more focused than if it's out of habit. We also should be mindful about approaching people as individuals rather than groups. You know what? I'm a nerd. I proudly profess I am a nerd. Now, what are some stereotypes that we have about nerds? <laughs> Go ahead and shout them out. You're not going to hurt my feelings. Go ahead and shout them out. Sit and read all the time. Well, as a graduate student, that's definitely true. No socialization skills. I would hope I have a few socialization skills being up here speaking. What else? Introverted. Introverted, okay. I would, I think most people who would talk to you would disagree with me on that one that I'm more extroverted than introverted. Anything else? Unattractive? Well, that's that one for everyone else, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be boastful and say I'm attractive or unattractive. But anyway, you get the point. There are these many criteria about nerds that some of them apply to me, such as being studious, and some of them don't apply to me, such as being introverted. So we run the risk when we use stereotypes of committing fundamental attribution error. Now, for those of you who are interested in these communication breakdowns, I encourage you to sign up for the net for a 201 course, SPCM 201, Interper Interpersonal Communication. I also encourage you later on in your junior or senior year to sign up for intercultural communication. Interpersonal communication will deals with how people interact with each other. Intercultural communication deals with how communication between cultures can break down and how to avoid that. In the meantime, I challenge each and every one of you to be mindful of how selection, organization, and interpretation affect the patterns that you perceive the world through and how it affects how you interact with others. Thank you very much.